In this episode of the House of Lechmere, I will quite simply try to answer the question, who really killed Liz Stride? In the previous episode, I investigated the murder of Liz Stride, the third of the so-called canonical victims of the serial killer known as Jack the Ripper, and the first of the two murders that took place in the early hours of the morning of Sunday the 30th September 1888, the night of the so-called double event. There'll be a link in the description below to that previous film if you haven't seen it already. In some quarters there's a question mark over whether or not Liz Stride should even be included among the murders attributed to Jack the Ripper. Arguably, because no one has been convicted of these crimes, we don't know with absolute certainty whether any of them are linked. However, when we don the shoes of someone engaged in a cold case reinvestigation of these murders, which is effectively what we're doing, then the sensible course is to have an eye on all of them and other similar unsolved murders to see if linkages can be made and see whether anyone who comes under suspicion can be linked or excluded from any of them. But I'll look specifically at the Liz Stride murder to see if there's any compelling evidence that suggests she should be excluded from the list. These are the arguments usually advanced for Stride not being a Ripper victim. Firstly, she didn't suffer from abdominal mutilations, but the obvious explanation is that the killer was disturbed before he had time to carry out all of his intended depredations and that was why it was a double event with the killer unsatisfied and unfulfilled after murdering Liz Stride which led to him looking for a second victim which turned out to be Catherine Eddowes. Some believe the killer deliberately intended to kill twice but I find that unconvincing precisely because the first victim did not suffer abdominal mutilations. The next two features can also be most easily explained by the killer being disturbed. The disturber would have been Louis Dimschutz, who drove his pony and cart into Duckfield's yard at about 1am on that fateful morning. The yard was very dark. The horse shied. Dimschutz dismounted. He realised a body was in the yard and went into the next door International Working Men's Educational Club for assistance. And while he was away, the presumption is that the killer fled. Secondly, Liz Stride's throat had been cut, but not quite as drastically as in the other cases. Only one slash was perpetrated and only the arteries on the left side were cut through, although that was enough for her to quite quickly bleed to death. However, Nichols, Chapman, Stride and Eddowes all had their throats cut from left to right. Thirdly, she was found on her side and not on her back. She was not even left remotely on display. As I said, both of these factors can be attributed to the killer being disturbed. Fourthly, she doesn't appear to have been strangled before death, although she was wearing a scarf and that was pulled tight, almost certainly by her attacker. The reason for strangulation in the other cases was probably to limit blood flow. In the case of Stride, he seems to have laid her on her side with the wound away from him to achieve the same end. Fifthly, she was murdered earlier in the night than the other victims, but this can be explained by it being a Saturday night. Sixthly, this was the only murder to occur south of Whitechapel Road, but all the victims were killed within about a mile of each other. So although this crime scene is further south, it still isn't very far away from the others. Seventhly, it suggested that the knife used to kill Stride was smaller than the ones used to kill the other victims. And so accordingly, uh, a different killer was responsible. The authority for this is the two doctors who examined Liz Stride, Baxter Phillips and Blackwell. But they were only giving an opinion as to whether one specific knife could have been responsible. One that had been found off Whitechapel Road and produced in evidence at the inquest. Although Phillips also suggested that a small shoemaker's knife could have been responsible. It might be noted here that Charles Lechmere's stepfather was a bootmaker and he lived very close to the crime scene. But let's not dwell on that possibility now. A longer blade was suggested for Chapman and Nichols and a six inch blade for Eddowes. Is that long? So the knife claim isn't very strong and it isn't as if the culprit could have had more than one knife. 
against these weak arguments, unsolved murders by knife with the throat cut of women in the street late at night were extremely rare. Her murder occurred in the East End, close to the other crime scenes, and in the same period. The police actually had a good clear up rate for normal murders as opposed to serial killings. Liz Stride was the same type of victim as the others. The crime scene itself was similar, a yard. So in my opinion, the reasoning behind excluding Stride from the overall list of Ripper victims is built on weak to no real foundations. Liz Stride's erstwhile boyfriend or partner, Michael Kidney, has been proposed as her killer. And that's a satisfactory suggestion to those who don't believe that Stride was a Ripper victim, which conveniently moves me on to discussion about suspects. Was Liz Stride the sole victim of a domestic murder? rather than being part of the Jack the Ripper series. The case against Kidney is essentially that he was abusive and jealous and that led to him killing Liz Stride. The abusive relationship angle is the main reason for suspecting Kidney, but is largely based upon misapprehensions. The evidence in favor of abuse is Stride said that she had argued with Kidney and that was why she'd moved out. Of their shared residence on Dorset Street, and into a lodging house at 32 Flower and Dean Street. Kidney denied they'd quarrelled, but perhaps he would, wouldn't he? Stride had made a complaint against Kidney for assault in 1887, but hadn't turned up at Thames Magistrates to press charges. So far as them having an abusive relationship, that's about it. There is a claim that Kidney used to padlock Stride into their room when he went out. This allegation was debunked by Tom Westcott in his book Ripper Confidential. I have to plug it as he pays me a retainer if I mention it. The room was padlocked to keep it secure when they both went out. The reason Liz Stride could go in and out when Kidney wasn't there was simply because she had her own key, which was found among her possessions when she was murdered. It seems likely that the police interrogated Kidney. Detective Inspector Swanson noted in a report from his desk at Scotland Yard, dated the 19th of October, Inquiry into her history did not disclose the slightest pretext for a motive on behalf of friends or associates or anybody who had known her. The police knew that Kidney was her partner and they were quite competent at solving domestic murders, so I think it's fair to assume that they checked Kidney out. We also know that Kidney, while drunk, voluntarily went to Lehman Street Police Station on the day after the murder. He insisted he wanted a young detective to help him solve the crime and made all sorts of wild statements, such as he would shoot himself if he was a local beat policeman, presumably out of shame at his incompetence. This is hardly the action of a guilty man. Swanson also noted in his 19th of October report, the numerous statements made to the police were inquired into and the persons were required to account for their presence at the time of the murders and every care taken as far as possible to verify their statements. This implies that when Kidney attended Lehman Street, he would have been checked out if he hadn't been already as Stride's partner. Lastly, Kidney had a prominent moustache and it doesn't match any of the eyewitness descriptions for what that's worth. The case against Kidney is based largely upon misapprehensions that he had he was an abusive relationship just as the case in general against Liz Stride being a Ripper victim is similarly weak and unlikely. I mentioned that Louis Dimschutz found Liz Stride's body and consequently he sometimes proposed as some sort of faux suspect as a clever dick response to the Lechmere theory on the basis that Lechmere is proposed as a suspect because he found Polly Nichols' body. This rather silly proposition fails to grasp the nuances inherent within the Lechmere theory. Lechmere isn't suspected because he simplistically found the body, but because of several interrelated factors. Life and death invariably involve complex scenarios. So, Lechmere was seen standing alone by the body. No one saw Dimschutz with the body. Lechmere had been with the body for an unknown length of time. Fanny Mortimer, who lived a few doors away, heard Dimschutz turn up on his pony and trap just before the alarm was raised, so he had no time gap. With Polly Nichols, there were indications that the killer had been disturbed by Robert Paul, 
as the wounds were covered to enable the killer to bluff his way out of the situation. With Liz's stride, there was no attempt to hide the wounds, but there were signs that the killer had been disturbed. If Dimschutz had been disturbed, who had done the disturbing? What made him stop? The logical conclusion was that Dimschutz had done the disturbing. It's true that Stride, like Nichols, had been very freshly slain, but again, that was because the killer had been disturbed. So of the factors associated with Lechmere finding the body, the only one that Dimschutz has in common with Lechmere is that they both found a freshly slain body. Furthermore, all the people at the crime scene at Duckfields Lard were almost immediately searched and their hands were inspected. This included Dimschutz. Stride was the first murder of the double event and Dimschutz would not be able to get to Mitre Square to kill Catherine Eddowes as he was with the police at Burner Street. That being the case, if Dimschutz was responsible, Stride must have been a lone victim. I've seen the suggestion that he might have been annoyed that a prostitute was hanging out in the yard and he carried out a spontaneous uh, blitz attack. Presumably he jumped down from his car, attacked her with his readily available knife and then calmly pretended he was innocent. I don't think this theory has much to recommend it. There is another Dimschutz theory proposed by an American author called Randy Williams that Dimschutz was part of a wider anarchist conspiracy involving members of the International Working Men's Educational Club. According to this theory, an anarchist gang committed the Jack the Ripper murders to undermine the authority of the bourgeoisie and draw attention to the plight of the working class. In particular, the downtrodden women who had to resort to prostitution in order to make ends meet and with whom they greatly sympathised. So they killed several prostitutes to highlight the fact that prostitutes were the exploited victims of capitalism, which seems odd. To these ruthless anarchists, the ends justified the means, I suppose. It would be true that, ideologically speaking, the anarchist and socialist members of the club would have empathised with the plight of prostitutes, which actually argues against Dimschutz attacking Stride out of annoyance. But brutally murdering five or more prostitutes to make a political point seems a bit drastic to me, but I stand to be corrected. Anyway, according to this theory, Dimschutz may have just been a lookout at Burner Street rather than the actual perpetrator of the Stride murder, while another gang member killed Eddowes at Mitre Square. Why they killed one of their victims right next door to their club, I'm not sure. That seems to be drawing attention right onto themselves. But what do I know? It also has to be said that their conspiracy, if such it was, was ridiculously and pathetically unsuccessful as they failed to provoke a revolution or advance anarchy in the UK one inch. I don't think there are any other comparable cases where revolutionaries have resorted to a series of brutal random murders of innocent members of the proletariat to undermine the legitimacy of the bourgeoisie. And I personally couldn't place any credence on this uh, theory whatsoever, but I thought I'd mention it. There were two private detectives who inserted themselves into this particular case, Charles Legrand and J.H. Batchelor. I mentioned them briefly in the previous film about Liz Stride's murder. Legrand was an interesting figure, a career criminal of the sort who spent the bulk of his life getting apprehended by the forces of law and order and then serving many long years at Her Majesty's pleasure in penal servitude. He could be quite brutal and was regarded as a dangerous prisoner. He went under a bewildering array of fake and alternative names and the police, as was their wont, kept meticulous lists of them so that his various offences could be linked together. In the strange world of ripperology, some people fail to understand that persons up to no good have a habit of concealing their true name. Legrand, as I'll call him, was actually Danish and at the end of his unsuccessful life of crime in 1917, he was deported back to Denmark as an undesirable alien. J.H. Batchelor was his sidekick, and nothing is known about him under that name. I'll restrict my examination of Legrand's behaviour to the events around the murder of Elizabeth Stride, which is in any event the only one of the Whitechapel murders to which he can be linked. If Legrand was a criminal, how did he appear as a private detective in Whitechapel? One of Legrand's main criminal activities was as a confidence trickster. He set himself up as a private investigator with an office in the Strand. With the Whitechapel murders in full spate, this provided 
an opportunity for Legrand to tender his services to assist in catching the culprit. Two particular targets for his less than helpful assistance were the Evening News and the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee. The Evening News had reported that Louis Dimschutz and another witness had noticed grapes in Liz Stride's right hand. The first we hear of Legrand is after the murder of Liz Stride when he turned up at Duckfield's yard on Tuesday the 2nd of October in search of a grape-shaped clue, in the pursuit of which he was of course successful. He found a grape stalk that he probably planted in the drains and then claimed it had got there after the yard had been cleaned up after the body was removed. He then went to see Matthew Packer who had a small fruit stall that he operated from his front window a couple of doors down from the yard. The day before Packer had already told the police in the shape of Sergeant White they had not seen anyone on the night in question and had shut up early at 11.30 p.m. Once under the spell of Legrand, Packer changed his story and said he sold some grapes to Stride and a mystery man. Packer said he saw this couple talking near the crime scene for half an hour afterwards. Packer said he sold the grapes at 11.45, which was 15 minutes after he'd told White he'd pulled down his shutter. But Packer's new version of events created a sighting that was much closer in time to the presumed murder. This was all covered in my last film on the murder of Liz Stride. This was all breathlessly published in the evening news on the 4th of October and they boasted that the Grand was working for them. They had their scoop claiming that the man who brought the grapes was the likely culprit and Le Grand was the hero of the hour. When the story broke, Sergeant White checked his notes and then went back to Burner Street to speak with Packer. Packer was at the mortuary with Le Grand and when White arrived, he was brushed aside. All White could do was impotently watch as Legrand whisked his prize asset off to Scotland Yard so that Packer could make his statement there. The police at Scotland Yard looked over the case. The glaring contradictions between Packer's initial statement and his subsequently remembering in elaborate detail that he had in fact seen someone rendered his evidence useless. Although Packer revised his timings back to agree that he had shut his shop at the time he had earlier told Sergeant White. As a coup de grace, Dr Bagster Phillips examined the contents of Stride's stomach and found no trace of anything grape-like. Furthermore, he'd looked at Stride's right hand, the one that had supposedly contained grapes, and just saw some blood. It's obvious that the witnesses who claimed to see grapes had been mistaken. Nevertheless, the suggestion that Liz Stride had grapes in her hand when she died has remained a persistent myth, one that features in Hollywood movies about the case. When he went to Scotland Yard to give himself more credibility, Legrand claimed he is also acting for the Vigilance Committee. It seems almost certain that he made this up along with the grape store. Swanson, in his 19th of October report, said, Mr Packer gave the following particulars to two private inquiry men acting conjointly with the Vigilance Committee and the press. Following Legrand's descent upon Scotland Yard in his handsome cab, Swanson came away with the belief that Legrand and Batchelor were acting conjointly with the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee and the Evening News. It is, however, almost certain that Legrand wasn't in fact in the employ of the Vigilance Committee and that claim was said by Legrand more in future hope than current reality. At this time, the Vigilance Committee reported that they already had three private detectives and that some others had tried to impress themselves upon them. These were almost certainly Legrand and Batchelor attempting to drum up business, but they were rejected. The Vigilance Committee also reported that they didn't have the money to pay for private detectives. Legrand wasn't easily deterred. A few days later, on the 10th of October, he broke another story. This time, he found a landlady in neighbouring Batty Street who claimed that someone had given her a bloody shirt to wash. This individual is known as the Batty Street Lodger. Messrs Grand and Bachelor, private detectives, received information yesterday afternoon which induced them to make inquiries in Batty Street, Whitechapel. They ascertained that a man, name unknown, recently left with Mrs Cale a shirt 
the sleeves of which were stained with blood. Information was sent to the police, who at once instituted inquiries, with what result is not known. Mrs Kale was able to give a good description of her mysterious customer, but the authorities do not consider it advisable to make it public. Little importance is attached to the incident, but it is pretty obvious that if the murderer wished to dispose of his blood-stained garment, he would get rid of it in a more effective manner than by leaving it with a lawn dress to be washed. Interestingly, this story was syndicated in a number of provincial newspapers, but seemingly not to the evening news, which suggests they terminated Legrand's retainer after the Packer episode. The landlady was actually called Coeur, not Kale, but in any case, this story was cleared up by the 15th of October when the Echo reported a strange and suspicious incident in connection with the Whitechapel murders has just been explained by the arrest, late on Saturday, of a German who the police had every reason to suspect as being connected to the murder of Elizabeth Stride at Burner Street. They then discovered that on the day after that crime, a German left a bloodstained shirt with a lawn dress at 22 Batley Street. Detectives Thick and White arrested the man suspected on Saturday night. He was conveyed to Lehman Street Station and inquiries were immediately set on foot. These resulted in the man's release this morning. Some newspapers continued to print stories about the bloody shirt, which just goes to show that the police had a difficult job controlling the misinformation that swirled around Whitechapel. Does the Batty Street Lodger or the bloody shirt feature in any of the police reports? No. Detective Inspector Edmund Reed led the investigation into the murder of Elizabeth Stride. If anyone was to know whether or not there was any truth in the Batty Street Lodger bloody shirt story, it was Reed. When he retired, he was very vocal in his reminiscences. Did he ever mention the Batty Street Lodger or the bloody shirt? This tells us that it was a false lead that blew up one day and was eliminated a few days later. The Batty Street Lodger features in several frankly desperate suspect theories where their man, Tumblety or Kuzminski for example, is claimed to be the Batty Street Lodger with an incriminating bloody shirt. Tumblety was a six foot flamboyant gay American with a huge handlebar moustache, a ridiculously unrealistic suspect to propose as a successful stealth serial killer. Imagine him stalking the streets of Whitechapel unnoticed. This book, The Lodger, which introduced Francis Tumblety as a suspect, is largely based around this debunked Batty Street Lodger nonsense. The clue is in the name. To be fair, it was written before Legrand's mucky fingers were found all over it, but it was co-written by the same person who wrote Edmund Reed's biography, which seems a little odd. Well might Deputy Commissioner Robert Anderson express his exasperation in an internal report when he said, the activity of the police has been to a considerable extent wasted through the exigencies of sensational journalism and the action of unprincipled persons who, from various motives, have endeavoured to mislead us. Legrand will have been one of those unprincipled persons. It is suggested that Legrand killed Stride and then inserted himself in the investigation to derail the police investigation to the point of gratuitously going to Scotland Yard and making a spectacle of himself in the press. He did this with an accomplice who could have turned him in for a reward if he was guilty, of course. There's nothing to support this beyond his appearance in Burner Street two days after Liz Stride was murdered and the fact that he was a criminal. He was prone to aggressive behaviour and was involved in a disorderly dispute with his girlfriend, who seems to have been a prostitute. But that was about it. It isn't much of a theory. Extortion and blackmail, with money as the motive, were his line, not murder. The only rational explanation for Legrand's involvement in the case is that he tried to manufacture evidence to make himself indispensable so that the evening news would continue to pay him a retainer and the vigilance committee would put him on their books. When that failed, he tried again with the Batty Street story. He falsified evidence in an attempt to achieve personal financial gain, which was one of his standard practices. It was another failed attempt to obtain money by deception, which was typical of his unsuccessful criminal career. I've got one more well-known suspect to come and then I'll give you my personal solution. But keep watching, don't forget to subscribe and like. 
I'm going to include Aaron Kosminski as a suspect linked to the murder of Liz Stride, as this is the only one of the Whitechapel murders to which he can be linked by reason of geography. I well remember a few years back when those who favour Kosminski as a suspect got very excited when it was discovered that his brother, Wolf, was living at 25 Providence Street in 1888, maybe 150 yards away from Duckfield's Yard, which put the site of Liz Stride's demise conveniently close to an address where Aaron Kosminski might have been living. According to Aaron Kosminski's medical records, he hadn't worked for years and was living with his relatives due to his poor mental health. He had three siblings in the East End, so in simplistic terms, there's a one in three chance he was living with Wolf. It had long been known that his sister Matilda and brother Isaac lived at Greenfield Street, somewhat further north towards Whitechapel Road. The geographical link to Duckfield's yard was further enhanced when it was discovered that in 1882, Wolf had lived at 38 Burner Street, literally next door to the International Working Men's Educational Club, although the club itself didn't open until 1885. This would suggest that Aaron would be familiar with the yard itself, which is immediately on the other side of the club. This all fits quite nicely. There's one other matter which might be thought to fit. Israel Schwartz, who was Jewish, claimed he saw a man, known as the broad-shouldered man, assault someone he identified as Liz Stride outside Duckfield's yard. The case against Kosminski solely rests upon the opinions of Robert Anderson, who was the head of the Criminal Investigation Department at Scotland Yard while the Jack the Ripper murders were being committed. In his autobiography, The Lighter Side of My Official Life, published in 1910, he said, The only person who ever had a good view of the murderer unhesitatingly identified the suspect the instant he was confronted with him, but he refused to give evidence against him. In saying he was a Polish Jew, I'm merely stating a definitely ascertained fact. Detective Inspector Donald Swanson served under Anderson and coordinated the investigation from his desk at Scotland Yard. In his personal copy of The Lighter Side of My Official Life, he added the following annotation in the margin against the above passage. Because the suspect was also a Jew, and because his evidence would convict the suspect, and witness would be the means of murder of being hanged, which he did not wish to be left on his mind. And after this identification, which suspect knew, no other murder of this kind took place in London. Swanson confirmed that Anderson's suspect was Kosminski, and it's often suggested that Schwartz might have been this elusive witness. So far, so good. It is, however, by no means certain that Schwartz saw an attack on Liz Stride, nor that it took place in Burner Street outside Duckfield's yard. Furthermore, the incident he described was a full 15 minutes before Stride was murdered, and the murderer seems to have been interrupted. For broad-shouldered man to be the culprit, he must have hung around for 15 minutes doing nothing. Also, Kosminski's medical records describe someone who was slight and not broad-shouldered, which was the defining characteristic of the man described by Schwartz. It seems doubtful that anyone, let alone Schwartz, would be able to positively identify someone seen so fleetingly in the dark. And in any case, the episode which Schwartz claimed to have witnessed was not a murder, but a fairly mild assault, and hardly seems to warrant the claim made by those two Scotland Yard desk jockeys, Swanson and Anderson, that he would be hung for murder. Swanson clearly recognised this, as he stated in that 19th of October report that it's not clearly proved that the man that Schwartz saw is the murderer. Given Swanson's doubts as to whether the man who Schwartz said he saw was the murderer, Schwartz's evidence could hardly have convicted and hung him, which categorically rules out Schwartz as a witness who could have in any way proved guilt. Lastly, it's slightly unclear whether the identification was when the witness saw the culprit in the act or when a later identification was arranged at a mysterious location called the Seaside Home. When Schwartz the witness saw the hypothetical culprit, broad-shouldered man, the broad-shouldered man also saw Schwartz. The recognition would have been mutual. Swanson says the suspect knew, but the culprit went on to kill Catherine Eddowes that very night and Mary Jane Kelly on the 9th of November. 
Yet Swanson said, no other murder of the kind took place. Also, if Schwartz was the witness who later attended the seaside home identification, why did he voluntarily turn up at Lehman Street Police Station to give his account of what happened if the person he saw was a co-religionist who he later refused to identify? None of it makes any sort of sense. Schwartz cannot have been the elusive seaside home witness, so he doesn't assist the case against Kosminski. Lastly, don't forget this was the night of the double event. After killing Liz Stride, the culprit headed towards Allgate and the City of London to find another victim. He found and killed Catherine Eddowes at Mitre Square and then left her bloodied apron in the entrance of Wentworth Model Dwellings on Golson Street. From there, Aaron, if he was the culprit, would have had to return home to Providence Street or even Greenfield Street. These districts would have been by then full of policemen on high alert looking for the Burner Street culprit. How on earth could Aaron have safely navigated his way past them? He couldn't have got home. The geography doesn't work for poor Aaron. That hopeful discovery of Wolf living in Providence Street does no service to the case against Kosminski after all. So what is my solution? The key to understanding the Stride murder is that it took place earlier in the night than the other Whitechapel murders at about 1am and it took place south of Whitechapel Road. These two factors have puzzled ripperologists for decades and as we have seen this has caused some to believe that Stride wasn't a victim of Jack the Ripper at all. In 1888 for the vast majority of people, their only day off from work was Sunday. The weekend started on Saturday night and ended Sunday night. With Lechmere as a suspect for the Polly Nichols murder, the accepted investigative process is to see if he had any connections to the Burner Street area. Would he know that district? Would he have any reason to go there? As I mentioned, when it was discovered that one of Kosminski's brothers lived at Providence Street, it was heralded as a major breakthrough in linking Kosminski to the Stride murder, as he couldn't be geographically linked to any other crime scenes beyond the vague there in the East End. Does Lechmere have any connections? The answer, of course, is yes, he does. During the Jack the Ripper murders, Lechmere was living at 22 Doveton Street, which is colloquially regarded as being part of Bethnal Green, but administratively it came under the parish of Mile End Old Town. However, he only moved there in June of that year. Prior to that, he'd been living at 20 James Street, now Burslem Street, and he'd lived there from about 1878. That was about 200 yards east of Burner Street as the crow flies. Furthermore, his mother Maria lived at 1 Mary Ann Street, about 180 yards south of Burner Street. Living with his mother was her second bigamous husband, Joseph Forsdyke. I discussed their irregular marriage in this film and will provide a link in the description below. Also living with his mother was one of Charles Lechmere's daughters, Mary Jane Lechmere. Mary Jane was for some reason brought up by her grandmother Maria rather than with her brothers and sisters at Doveton Street. Lechmere had reason to visit the environs of Burner Street on his one night off when he almost certainly didn't have to go to work the next day. He could have been visiting or drinking in a local pub with old neighbourhood friends from his long-term residence in that area. He could have been visiting his mother and daughter and Burner Street would have been pretty much on his route home to Doveton Street. My conjecture is that Lechmere left this area in the mood to kill and came across Stride as she patrolled those streets looking for custom. There's the slight chance he may have recognised her. Lechmere worked for Pickfords at their Broad Street goods station depot, but it isn't unusual for workmen to visit other company depots. He would almost certainly have been to their large Pickford stables at Poplar High Street, which serviced their Poplar Station depot, which in turn was on the Broad Street railway line. Did Lechmere ever visit the Strides Coffee House on Poplar High Street for a cup of char, if indeed it was a real coffee house? Were they seen by any of the eyewitnesses on Burner Street? It seems doubtful, as the most recent sighting was at 12.45 and the murder took place 15 minutes later the deed itself would have not taken much more than a minute. Would the culprit, whoever you might think he was, have hung around talking to Stride in the street for 15 minutes 
incite a beat policeman and various passers-by, I doubt it. But if you want to have faith in these witnesses, they went through in some detail in, in the previous episode, there's nothing to rule Lechmere out from any of those descriptions. Fanny Mortimer had been standing outside her house at 36 Burner Street, just a few doors down from Duffield's Yard, at about five to one, then she went inside and bolted her door. Then Lechmere and Stride silently and unobtrusively went into Duckfield's yard with very different intentions. But before the killer could fully realise his sick fantasies, he was disturbed by the approach of Dimschutz and his pony and trap, which Fanny Mortimer had heard pass just moments before. The culprit left Liz Stride's lifeless body and hid in the darkness of the yard. Dimschutz was confused by what he'd found and immediately went inside the International Working Men's Educational Club for assistance. Lechmere seized the moment and made his escape. After the Nichols murder and his enforced appearance at an inquest, Lechmere could not afford to be at another crime scene. He had to flee. There's one other point to consider here. Lechmere's mother Maria's first bigamous husband was called Thomas Cross, and that is where Charles Lechmere had obtained the alternative name which he used when he testified on the 3rd of September 1888 at the inquest into the death of Polly Nichols. It's fair to say there's some controversy over Charles Lechmere's use of the name Cross at the inquest, not least because in every definitive record we have for Lechmere, he used the name Lechmere and not Cross. By 1888, Thomas Cross was long dead, but some suggest that Charles Lechmere was brought up under the name Charles Cross. In 1869, while Thomas Cross was still alive and they were all living in the same household, his sister Emily died. The informant who provided the details of her death to the registrar was Mary Ann Marshall, a neighbour living in the same street. Mary Ann Street. Yes, confusingly, Mary Ann Marshall lived in Mary Ann Street. Mary Ann Marshall registered her as Emily Lechmere, not Emily Cross, which is a very strong indication that the children were known locally under the name Lechmere and not Cross. By 1888, the Marshall family had moved a few streets away to Burner Street, and Mary Ann's husband was a witness at Liz Stride's inquest. Again, I mentioned this in the last episode. If Lechmere had been seen in the vicinity before or even after the murder, what would anyone think? Oh, there's Charles Lechmere. Or, oh, there's Charles Cross. Hang on, didn't he testify at the Nichols inquest? Anyway, just saying. Instead of going home with his bloodlust unsated, the culprit went in search of a second victim. So he turned quickly towards Allgate, an area popular with prostitutes, an area Lechmere would have been very familiar with as he had trod that path for 20 years while living at James Street and working at Broad Street. Fanny Mortimer, we know, was by then inside her house. There were no witnesses in Burner Street. My guess is that Lechmere, or your preferred mystery phantom, would have headed north towards Commercial Road. It's quite a distance and I think he would have wanted to be out of sight of the yard as soon as possible. So he would have taken one of two cut-throughs that led to Backchurch Lane and from there he could access Commercial Road, which would have been relatively busy. Once he reached Commercial Road, he would have turned left or west. Then where? Philip Sudden, in The Complete History of Jack the Ripper, found a curious report that appeared in the Star on the 1st of October. From two different sources, we have the story that a man, when passing through Church Lane at about half past one, saw a man sitting on a doorstep and wiping his hands. As everyone is on the lookout for the murderer, the man looked at the stranger with a certain amount of suspicion, whereupon he tried to conceal his face. He's described as a man who wore a short jacket and a sailor's hat. Church Lane was a discreet cut through between Commercial Road and Whitechapel High Street. From there, it's but a short distance to Allgate High Street and St. Botolph's Church. In that vicinity, he found Catherine Eddowes, who took him to Mitre Square, where he murdered her and mutilated her body in the most bestial fashion. Then he left for home and discarded part of Catherine Eddowes' bloody apron in a doorway at Wentworth Model Dwellings on Goldston Street, under some graffiti that famously read, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Was this a reference to him being disturbed outside the Jewish Anarchist Club? Lechmere's local knowledge would have informed him of the character of that club. 
Was he projecting blame for having committed two murders on one night onto the Jews? And as I've pointed out many times, the route onwards from Mitre Square past Wentworth model dwellings led directly towards his sanctuary back at Doveton Street. So this is my simple solution to the crime and it fits like a glove. Tell me what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, share, like and hit that notification bell wherever it might be.